sex before I leave here, before I get home. <laughs> also, there's a Chevy Equinox license plate F2D8282. It's parking in the no parking area in front of the church. We would like the owner for that vehicle to please remove it, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Please, please stand for the scripture reading, which is taken from Philippians 3, 12 through 16. I will read and you will follow. Chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 16. Not as though I had already obtained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark by the price of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same group. Let us mind the same thing. May you be blessed by the reading. Amen. Come by here. Come by here. 
come by here. And so, dear God, your blessings upon the deacons and deaconesses of this church. We pray your blessings on all the officers. We pray your special blessings on the pastor and his family. Pray your special blessings on the children of this household of faith. Pray your blessings on those who are considered senior citizens. Bless Lord, bless Lord, bless Lord. Not only do we pray for Jefferson Avenue, but we pray for all of our brothers, sisters, and our other communions of service today, asking you to be with us and to encourage us because we live in a world that is foreign to the Christian mind. Sin runs rampant. And Father, we are caught up in it sometimes, so much so that we need to drop on our knees and cry out, Save us, Lord God. Cry out like Peter did when he was going down in the water and his faith had deserted him. And he thought he was going to drown. He cried, Lord, save me. This is our cry this morning. Come by here, dear God, and bless us. And pray your blessings on each one. Keep in your care. And bind to your heart. In the loving name of Jesus, then use your servant when he stands. Because we are living in some crucial and critical times. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you for this opportunity. Amen and amen.
But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Your curse was a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring your tithes and offerings. That there may be meat in my house, and prove me now here, said the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, said the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed. And you shall be a delightful man, says the Lord of hosts. Give me, Father, dear God, we thank you once again for the blessed privilege of returning that which is your own. We pray that you will bless those who have given, and those who could and did not. We pray that you will help them to remember the curse. For these blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
Streamers. Hmm? Should you give your answer? You say your answer. Go ahead. What else? Streamers. What about all those things and then decorations too? Can you imagine a king had a son and he wanted everybody to come to his party? And when he got everything ready, all the streamers, all the balloons, all the pizza, all the chips, all the cake, right? All the stuff. And he got everything ready. And when it was time for the party, nobody came. I mean, nobody, nobody, nobody. You could hear crickets going, what are they doing? The crickets is going, what are they doing? Because you can hear crickets, that's how quiet it was. And so the king was saying, I don't believe it. I sent an invitation and nobody came. This is a couple of excuses they gave. I have a bad cold and I just can't seem to get over it. I think I'm going to go visit my grandmother. We're having a test tomorrow at school and I need to stay home and study. I have to go to soccer practice. Mom said I had to be babysitting my little brother. And a whole bunch of excuses, but nobody came. Let me ask you, how would you feel if nobody came to the party for prayer? You feel sad? How about you? Would you be sad? How about you? Would you be sad? Well, let me tell you, this king was sad, and after he was finished being sad, he got angry. I can't believe this. I put all this food, all this cake, all of these streamers, all of this stuff, and nobody came to told his servants. You know what? And anybody you see, anybody you see that wants to come, you tell them to come. And when the story was over, his whole house was so full of people, it was even more people came than the ones he invited. Now, let me tell you the story. The story. God is the king. Jesus is the son. And the party is in heaven. Amen. Yeah. yeah. How are you supposed to get there? Well, first you have to have an invitation. And everybody who has a Bible, would you take it out for me, please? Everybody who has a Bible, I don't care if it's electronic. If you have a Bible, pull it up. That's your invitation. Yeah. Your invitation to heaven. Now, how about you? I don't want King God to be here. Because he sent an invitation. Are you supposed to go? Who wants to go to heaven? The heaven party. Who, excuse me. Who wants to go to the heaven party? Everybody's hands should be up. Matter of fact, if you're right, you should have two hands up. All of us want to go to the heaven party. I want to see you there. I want to see you there. I want to see you there. I want to see all of us there. Amen? Amen. Dear God, everybody, dear God, dear God help, us help us to remember that you sent us an invitation to a celebration. We want to be there. We're going to do everything we can to make sure we're there. I want to go. See you there, God. Amen.
Hello, everybody. Good to see you. God is still in the blessing business. I'm thankful for it. I'm looking out to the end. I just spot my wife. That's the end. I, uh, God gave her to me so that she could inspire me. God's inspiration is great. And he gave her to me to do that for me. You see me looking that way a whole lot. I love looking at her. <laughs> But beyond that, 
the call of every member of the church, every member to be faithful to their duties that's called upon to do by God. Turn with me now to the book of Micah, chapter 6, and verse 8. And I'm reading this verse 8 from the King James Version. The Bible says, He has showed you, O man, what is good. What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? It was amazing to me to see how this uh, verse is constructed. Now, I'm not going to go into all the constructions of the nouns and verbs and all of that today. But I notice here it begins with, He has showed you, O the old man, what is good. That's where the question mark should have come. Because the rest of it is instruction to those of God's people who need it. And brothers and sisters, we all need the instructions of God. Don't you say so? My God is a tremendous and wonderful God. How about yours? Because we serve the same God, don't we? All right. Looking at that, it goes, oh man, what is good? What is good? And then he goes on to say, what doth the Lord require thee? That's a question. But to do good, but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. We find that in our churches, all of the departments, all of the ministries of our churches should have the blessings of God upon us. We're not called to be servants of God in this church to just sit around, put our thumbs, pat our feet, sometimes feel good. There's something beyond that. And that is, every member of the church is a potential, no, I changed that, is to be his servant, reaching souls for Christ, not only in here, but out there as well. Amen. This is a church with a mission. It's not a church that's just static. We are a people who is controlled and blessed by the Holy Spirit of God, and when he takes over, man, something takes place in our little hearts. <laughs> what a God we serve. Don't you say so? So I'll call then and the reason for this text of scripture, when you do the uh, do the study of the context, that's the verses that surround it, you will find out why Micah wrote like this. When we take a look at chapter 6 and we look at verse 7, will the God Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn of my trans for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What was taking place here? This is what was happening. Israel had left the side, left God. They, they had gone backwards with, uh, backwards with God. They had sinned terribly. And God call, calls for people who are sinners like us to repent and be obedient to his divine will. So then, Israel had done just that. They had gone away from God. They stepped away from him. They were sinning. And especially this one place where it says, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? You see, Israel had come to the place where they were sacrificing, especially the kings. They were sacrificing their children to appease their God, to please their God. So Micah said, I've got to do something about this. They are saying, we have to do all of these things to please God. But he said, ah, oh, look at verse 8, look at verse 8. He has shown you, oh man, what is good. What is good? 
And what does the Lord require of you? He said, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Three things. They had done as the Pharisees of old had done. They had laid go to the church down with the these and the thou and the who was and the who done it and all of these things. When Jesus said, the way is simple. You don't have to be dealing with a whole lot of who, uh, who does who shall judge. But all you have to do is come back, look at scripture, and I will tell you what you're supposed to do. How you're supposed to walk. The church today, unfortunately, has loaded itself down by a whole lot of parasitical things. We have lost for this, lost for that, lost for that. And God said, the only law you are to deal with in these days is the ten, command, ten Commandments that I've laid out before you. I wrote it with my own hand. But there are those who say, uh huh, Lord, but we don't trust you. We've got to do our own thing. We've got to write our own laws on and then live by them. Uh huh. God says, I'm looking for a people who's obedient to me. Amen. The New Testament, the New King James Version puts it this way very much alike. He has shown you, old man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Very simple. He laid it out. A message to Israel. In verse 1 it says, Now hear what the Lord says. And that's when he came on with this verse 8. You've got to turn around and follow me. God is only interested. Listen to this now, friends. God is only interested in our practical our practicing unadulterated truth. What is it? The Word of God. I read some other books as well, but they've got to be on, on cue, on point, with the Bible. Because if it's not, then I'm subject to walk and fall off a cliff rather than holding on to the hand of God. Ah. It gets gooder. Teachers excuse that. <laughs> it gets gooder and gooder. Better and better. I should do it right. So God is calling for obedience. You know, there's the old saying, uh, boys will be boys. That's the dumbest, I mean, that's what I'm saying. That's the worst thing that we could deal with. Because usually when we use that phrase, it's dealing with something that boys do in getting in trouble. Yeah. So we said, but 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man. M A N. A man. God does not expect us to continue to be children. He says, You are to grow in maturity in your Christian walk with me. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, when I was a child, yeah. Now he says, You're a man. You're to put away. Your toys. Stop playing around. Get serious about this business with the Lord. That's what has kept us behind so long because we have not been doing what God has called us to do. Now, praise God, you do that here. So maybe I'll. <laughs> there we are. When I became a man, I thought as a man, and all of those good things. Israel had turned away from God through polluted practice of the heathen nations around them. They became the tail and not the head. And God says, we are supposed to be the head, not the tail. And I'm glad to see you 
you can think of that way as the head of praise God. We're not there yet, folks. We still have a ways to go. It's not, it's, I'm not preaching just to us here. We have, we, we feel that the church is all right. No, there's some things that need to be dealt with in our churches so that God's church can get on the right track and head toward the kingdom of God. Amen. And stop pitting around here on this earth because Jesus should have come already, but we have failed to do the work completely that he has. I'm glad we're going away. Have you heard the saying, you must uh, take, a bull, take the bull by the horns? You've heard that. When you take the bull by the horns, he can be controlled, they say. You take him by the tail, and he'll toss you all over. I mean, he'll turn you inside out, round and round, and you don't know which way he's going to turn you again. But when we turn, now, the fact of the matter is, when we take the bull by the horns, the fact is, and reality check, reality check, we still cannot control anything because all control and power is of God. Through Jesus Christ. And in and fetched and continued by the Holy Spirit. The three of the Godhead. And then you and I become a part of that Godhead because then you have not only God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but He has you. We are His children, right? Whether we're messing up, whether we're not messing up, and in this world we do mess up. <laughs> Those pitiful folk like us. But praise God, his love is so great. Yeah. yeah. So powerful, so wonderful, that with all of my faults, he still accepts me as his child. Yes. So not only now do we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, now he has him in terms of all of his mess-ups. But because of his love, yes. so great, yes. that's the reason I like to look at my wife, because when I mess up, she, she forgives me. <laughs> I'm not talking about really messing up. <laughs> Y'all gotta understand that. She's not gonna take any foolishness. <laughs> when I became a man. <laughs> when I, and by the way, that, that thing about becoming a man is, is dealing with becoming perfect. You get that? Yeah. Being perfect. Now, who of us can become, be really perfect? Dr. Bowman, you could even help me out again. That's being perfect. We're not perfect in an, in an imperfect world, are we? But what the Bible is speaking of here, the word of perfection or per being perfect, is the word that means maturity or becoming mature. And that word mature means that there are areas in our lives that we continue to grow and mature and mature and mature. That when a baby is born, he is not a mature man. He has five fingers on each hand, uh, five toes on his, each foot. Yeah, that's got it. <laughs> on each foot. And he, he can see and all of these things. But he stays there and cries and cries and cries until he gets your attention. And if he doesn't get your attention, he's going to let you know. I thought of pacifying to anyway. <laughs> the theme for today, and I may have messed it up a little bit, but this is my twist on it. Saved by grace. Yeah. Walking by faith. Yeah. But beyond that, working by his power. Oh yes, working by his power, the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, these words, but you shall receive power. 
the New King James Version. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. That's the local church. And in all Judea, that's the receptive territory. And Samaria, hostile territory. And to the end of the earth, that's global. And I'm glad to be a part of a church that's gone, has been global for a long time. With a message, mission to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only becoming a Seventh-day Adventist and, and worshiping God on, the, on his holy day that he has given to man. And not only, but he loves to know that we have not messed it up. That it still stands. And we have not come to the place to do what the popular people do. We have held to the word of God. And that's the reason you're here on Saturday when you should be out shopping. <laughs> According to the world. According to the world. But praise God, there is a people that he claims as his own. That says, we have gone to the Bible. And we see what the Bible says. And it says the seventh day is the seventh. Ah, ah, yeah, that's me. No matter how unpopular it may be for me, I hold to the word of God. And though somebody may uh, talk about me, slam me, whatever they may do, I'm still going to hold to the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they say, Hold to God's unchanging hand. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Uh, things eternal in the book. Yeah. Now, that's just, in, uh, uh, let's see, yeah. Don't want to miss the place here. Yeah. You shall receive power. Witnesses, you'll be witnesses. Beyond that, beyond our churches, beyond our receptive territories, there are the hostile territories that we must reach for Christ. There will be people who will hound you and hunt you down, but we still have to open the word of God to whomever we come across. And though we be uh, crucified by people, there's life in Jesus Christ. Life in Jesus Christ. Beyond duties of respective officers in the church, there is one office that's not listed in the church manual. And it should be an office that we all hold a part in. And that's the office of membership. You have personal ministries, you have Relationships. We have uh, daughters. We have youth. We have what's up? Yes, deacons. Right? Uh, elders. All of these. But there's no place for the office of membership. And we celebrate the officers and the officers and all of this. But I praise God that we can celebrate the fact that every member in the church has an office that they must maintain yeah. in their Christian experience. Around this thing. I tend to walk a little bit. And this one I can still walk. Not my age, but you don't even know that. <laughs> Beyond the offices, offices. You may not be a Sabbath school teacher. You may not be an elder. You may not be a Dorgan's leader. You may not have a personal ministry. You may, they may miss you on the way, but friends of mine, they can't take away your membership unless you mess it up. That's there. It's solid. You're a member of God's household, and you will stay there as long as you behave yourself. Amen. Amen. 
There's a way to get rid of no. no. <laughs> Don't put it that way. All right. So, with all of the offices in the church, including your membership, you are a part of the household of faith. Beyond that, we must recognize the administrator. And by the way, the administrator is not the conference president. The administrator is not uh, a bishop or somewhere, but it's Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. He is the administrator. Yeah. The administrator, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is the executive secretary. Amen. <laughs> Jesus said, He, when the Spirit of truth is come, John 15, 26, He will testify of me. That's the executive secretary. I'm not talking about the church secretary of the conference. I'm talking about the Godhead, God, Jesus Christ, administrator, Holy Spirit, God the Father, He's the head of it all. Beyond that, His sojourn, speaking of Jesus now, upon earth, His enemies, those who hated Him, those who cried, crucify Him, there. Who, those who spat on him, those who nailed him to the cross. For you see, we cannot and must not deal with any message that deals with any people anywhere. As much as we love your deacons and deaconesses, we must still deal with the head one who is the administrator, and that's Jesus Christ. I have no place for you to go to be saved. I have no salvation for you, but praise, praise God, Jesus does. He is the one. There were those who hated him, those who tried to crucify him, crucify him, those who nailed him to the cross. Beyond that, in all of our activities in our church, we find that Jesus went to the cross for all of us. Deacons, deaconesses, each and every one of us. He gave himself. So beyond all that we talk about in the church and out of the church and, and deal with in our churches, we must also recognize the one who is the head of it all, and that's Christ Jesus. When they took him, led him, laid the whip on him, he allowed himself to be hung on a cruel cross. And when they hung him, there were two others beside him. The Bible says that two of them railed on him. They mocked him. They called him all kinds of names. And then one, the Bible says that was one who came to himself and recognized that something was different about this man hanging there. And then he cried, Lord, save me. And Jesus and the others kept on fussing and cussing and carrying on. And there, there they were giving him a hard, he was giving him a hard time. This one said, you ought to shut up, man. Here's this Jesus that you, that's here. He's the Messiah. They couldn't understand that, gentlemen. They couldn't understand that. Here is the Savior of the world dying. They did not understand the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation was to call for someone to die. And Jesus said, I will be the one. He was the one who hung on the cross and bled and died for you and for me. He was the one. But then beyond that, he says to you and to me, like he did that thief on the cross, he says, I will save you. you get ready. You are some hard-headed people. Problems all over the place. Can't understand anything that I've told you. He had already talked to the disciples. He had talked with them. He had taught them all along the way. And yet they still didn't understand why Jesus had to go to a cross. In fact, Peter came to the place and said, Father, uh, Jesus, this can't be you. You ought to just denounce this thing and go about your business. It's not you. Jesus said, uh -uh, Peter, you don't understand it. And what wrong with that? Peter didn't deny him. 
three times. But he did not once, the three rooster crows. And Peter wept when he looked into the face of Jesus as they were leading him to Mount Calvary. When they led Jesus there, nailed him to the cross, placed his body there, hung him on a cross, uh, the cross was dropped into a hole, and the crossbar of the, the crossbar, they nailed his hands, they nailed his feet, and when they did that, there was mercy shown through Jesus Christ for uh, Jesus Christ as he hung there because he had such a love for you and for me. Oh, for it's mine. We recognize that all of our offices of the church must be pointed to one thing, and that is salvation through Jesus Christ. There must be a buildup on all sides because he's the one. It doesn't matter who is what in the church. As long as he is, I keep on wanting to say hey, Pancho, but that's not, that's not, that doesn't sound right to me, so I, I'm not going to use that one. I'm going to leave that alone. But he, as long as he is head, then the church is on the right road, and when he's on the right road, and we accept him as our Savior, beyond that, we will be in the kingdom of God. He says we'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more. And you and I are gathered on the sea of glass, and when Jesus looks out at us, and he, 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 he says, these are my children, these are my first fruits, these are the people that have been saved because of what they have been doing. And we look around and say, Lord, what are we doing? The fact of the matter is, we look at ourselves and really want to say, what in the world have we been doing? But you see, Jesus, when he died, his activities became our activities when we accepted him as our Savior. He's the one. He's our Lord and Savior. And I love this uh, thing about he looked beyond my faults yes. and saw my needs. Sin, sick soul that I am. That's the reason let me tell you something. That's the reason that no one in our church should talk about anybody else. Because we are sinners and we are saved by grace. Saved by grace. I don't care what you have, what you've done, what, what, and who you are. We are nobody until we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, our Lord, and our Redeemer. He is Lord, He is Savior, He is our King. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise, for it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know just why he came to love me. So Oh! 
to let go of and go now. But I want to declare to you today that Jesus, when he died, on that old rugged cross, shed his blood that I might live on the field that exudes from me. All of the problems that I've had in my life, all that you've gone through, sometimes wondering if I've made it but Jesus can take me and say, welcome my child, come on in. Yes. I wonder sometimes, but then I'm reminded, oh yes, of what he has done, done for me and what he went through for me. His life, his death, his life. There is a process that we must recognize today. Before Jesus came, there would be no salvation for us. Yes, he came, but something had to take place even after he came, and that was the cross. When he went to the cross, shed his blood for you and for me. Died there on Calvary. I tell you, when his blood drained down and dripped upon Mother Earth, it says that there's life from a children. I want you now to give your heart to me, he says. And today, I'll visit with you. I want to be saved, I want to. I want to be in the kingdom, raise your hand. I want to be there. Hallelujah. Praise God. He looks with God, God in my thoughts. It's so How about you today? Thank you. 
Collins, and Mr. Thomas for their presentation today. Certainly their heart has been blessed, and we continue to pray for them and their ministry. He's retired, but as you see, he's still speaking for the Lord. Thank you, Sister Thomas, for the beautiful number. This time I'm going to call the Deacon Smart from one more time. Thank you, Pastor Stams. Church, this was a wonderful, wonderful sermon. May our heart be within us and that we continue to worship and that we continue to serve God, that He may continue to bless us. Pastor Stams, we just want to thank you so much. You know, when I first came to this church, Pastor Stams was the pastor, and he's the one that ordained me. So I have a special love in my heart to Pastor Thomas. And Pastor Thomas, just to show appreciation, we have a little token for you today. And thank you so much. I must say, what a man, what a man. Earlier today, we, um, we called Everton, but he wasn't here, now he's here at this time. So we're going to have Everton to come up. This is one of the gentlemen that's helped us around the church. He's not a member for a church, but he's faithfully helped us, you know, doing pipes and all this stuff when we are working around here. So we just want to show him our appreciation for doing that for us. Happy Sabbath Church. Our closing hymn is hymn number 214, We Have This Hope. Again, that is 214, We Have This Hope. Please stand.
that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for a few questions.